This is a, a unique opportunity. We're going to, in a few minutes, I think about five minutes, we're going to have the opportunity to talk to somebody on the International Space Station. And that person just happens to be my twin brother, Scott. <laughs> so I spoke to him yesterday, and I told him that all of you would have some really fantastic questions for him. Now, often when he does events like this, he hears the same question over and over again. And it's very rare to get a new question. But I promised him today that somebody in this audience is going to come up with a new question for my brother in space. But let me first start with uh, where he is and what is, what, what is he doing. So we launched the International Space Station. The first parts of it were launched in the late 90s. And by 1998, we had the first crew of three individuals living on the space station, which consisted at that time of one American astronaut and two Russian cosmonauts. And since 1998, we have added continuous uh, manning of the space station with crew members from around the world. Our partners on the space station, it's not, it's not only the United States, our, our partners are the Russians, the Canadians, the Japanese, and 16 European nations. And the crew that's currently aboard the space station consists of, it's currently six individuals, my twin brother who is the commander of the International Space Station, there's a Japanese astronaut, there's another US astronaut, and then there are typically always three Russian cosmonauts on board. And two, two of the Russian cosmonauts are individuals that I've flown in space with in the past. So, you know, while we, uh, it, it's a continuous change of who is aboard the space station, it is really quite a community of individuals from around the world that have this very unique opportunity to go to, the, to this unique place. So the space station consists of a bunch of modules to give you some perspective of how big it is. Often people think it's rather small. But if it was to sit on well, what we here in the U.S. now use as a, as a increment of measurement, a football field, it barely covers a full-size football field, meaning that the solar rays and the trust actually hang over the 50-yard line a little bit, uh, and actually the modules do, and out to the end zones would go the trust and the solar rays. So it's a pretty big facility, and internally the volume of the ISS is about 4,500 square feet. So it's the size of a, you know, a decent sized house. So when you think of six individuals being there for an extended period of time, it's not a place that, uh, like, similar to like uh, the space shuttle where it's very confining. It's actually a pretty good environment to live in. And in zero gravity, you have this, uh, you know, unique opportunity to, to use a lot more space of the place you're living in. Not only can they use like the floor, we normally walk around on the floor, but all this volume overhead, you know, you have another floor above you. And a wall might as well be a floor. And uh, so it is a rather, a, a rather big volume. The space station orbits the planet at about 250 miles. It's going 17,500 miles an hour. So every 90 minutes, it goes around the, goes, goes around the Earth once. Uh, sometimes we have to raise the altitude of the space station, so we have to boost it as a little bit of drag brings it down. The plan is to fly, to continue to fly ISS out to, um, well, at least out to about 2025. And then we've got to figure out how do you take this thing that weighs a million pounds and get it back to Earth safely which can be a, a, a very challenging um, thing to do. My brother has flown in space four times. This is his fourth flight, obviously. And he's going to spend a year in space. Now, we've never sent an American into space for a year before. It's a rather unique thing to do. Um, our experience with long duration space flight is with a lot of crew members who have stayed six months. But NASA has this goal that by, I mean, the goal is by 2035, 2035 to land a human on Mars. 
And to get somebody to Mars, it's going to take a lot longer than six months. It'll even take a lot longer than a year. We're talking about something that might be a two and a half year trip. So we have to have more experience about what it's going to be like to have crew members in space for an extended period of time. And there's a lot of adverse effects from flying in space. There's issues with the radiation and the lack of gravity and how it affects your bone loss and your immune system, um, even your optic nerves. We've had recently have been seeing trouble with uh, crew members' vision after they get back from space from an extended period of time. So there are a lot of challenges we have to overcome to one day send people um, you know, to Mars and further out in, in the solar system. So in a second here, I'm going to introduce my brother. We're going to connect up to the space station. You're going to see a screen here with his image. He's probably going to be in the US laboratory or the Japanese laboratory module. These are state-of-the-art facilities. During his year in space, he'll be doing about 400 different experiments on things like material science and basic physics, chemistry, biology, uh, and other things. Um, we're also doing a study. NASA's doing a, a pretty extensive study on the two of us, where my brother, well, he's the guinea pig in space, and I'm the control, I'm the control guinea pig on the ground. So I often make trips to Houston to uh, deliver um, large samples of blood and everything else. If you can imagine what the everything else is. Um, so we're, we're going to have an opportunity to ask, ask him some questions here in just a second, assuming this all works. And it usually does. So just stand I by. I am ready for the event. Google site guys, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Scott, this is Mark. How do you hear? Hi. Have you loud and clear? A little bit of an echo, but uh, not too bad. Well, I see you're in the uh, Japanese laboratory with a little airlock behind you. Um, I actually brought this module up to space on my third flight. And we're going to line some folks up here at the microphones. So why don't we start getting people up, because this is an opportunity for all of you to ask him some questions. But I'm going to start off and say, just uh, how, how are you feeling today? Feeling pretty good, although uh, I just had an eye exam, so my eyes are dilated. But uh, I can't see you guys anyway, so it doesn't matter. I'm just staring into a camera. But it is kind of bright in here, and that's why I'm, I'm uh, squinting. But uh, we had a busy day. Did some uh, medical eye tests and uh, getting ready for a spacewalk next week. So we spent a lot of time doing that. And your first question is from? Uh, Adam Getty. Uh, to keep your brother honest, he made a promise to you that we'd ask a question you've probably never been asked. So what's the one question you want to be asked that nobody ever has? <laughs> You know, it's interesting. I, I get a lot of the same questions uh, over and over, so I get pretty good at answering those. And uh, I had uh, one space reporter a few months ago. Actually, his name is Bill Harwood. He asked me some, uh, some tough questions about, uh, you know, space policy and the budget and uh, funding for commercial crew. And, you know, I kind of like answering those questions. I can't think of a, a specific one that I've never been asked, but, uh, you know, getting the, uh, the non-standard, uh, the questions we don't get all the time are the ones I kind of enjoy asking or answering more. So, so Scott, the next uh, question is coming from an Army guy. So I'm going to apologize in advance, but this is Kip Parker. <laughs> Or, or try to use small words so the Kelly brothers can understand it. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I'm like a lot of people when, when we're going to unmanned aerial vehicles and driverless cars, everyone's wondering why we're, we're still doing manned space flight. And it, I understand that it used to be that you could either have an unmanned flight or a manned flight. But now with work that DARPA is doing, the NIH, uh, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. Now we have an in-between, organs on chips, where we can put parts of humans made from stem cells that can do various physiological functions. We can take data from them. We can make cellular computers. 
Have you ever thought about or is anyone discussing the whole idea of exploring the in-between between a manned space flight and an unmanned space flight? Hey, Scott, let me just add for a second. I think what Kit is getting, we, we talked about this the other day. And we talked about this the other day, and what he's referring to actually is maybe you send parts of people. Yeah, is that correct? Or, or organs on chips where you have specific parts of a human that are built from stem cells. You know, I, I've never heard that, and uh, actually I've never uh, thought so about I, so that I win. So I win the uh, question. Interesting idea. You know, when people talk about the advantages and disadvantages of, of human spaceflight versus uh, robotics, you know, things that are often brought up, and I, I would agree with this, and I think the people that do a lot of the robotics uh, uh, science, especially on Mars, will agree that, uh, you know, so far humans are able to do a lot more work than, uh, than robots. Now they, of course, need a lot more support and you need to take care of them a lot better than you do robots. But the, uh, you know, the Mars rovers that have been operating on Mars for, for well over a decade now have done a, the amount of science that uh, you know, a few astronauts could have done there in a matter of days. So it's, uh, you know, there, are, there are advantages and, uh, and disadvantages to human exploration. I think certainly the, uh, you know, just the, the romantic aspect, aspect of it, the, the fact that you know, people are, we are naturally, naturally explorers I think the, uh, you know, the motivation that provides for kids and, uh, you know, their desire to be educated in the science is also a, a factor with human exploration. But the question you ask, ask is really a, uh, you know, a great one and one that I have never been asked before. So he does win. Scott, the next question is from Alan Eustace. And Alan's a Google executive who jumped from 135,000 feet, only human, I believe, to ever survive being supersonic in a suit. Um, so, Alan, go ahead. So, uh, the, uh, I know you do a lot of experiments up there, and I was curious about the experiments that you do. Do you know what the science is behind those experiments? And what's an experiment that you did that surprised you with an outcome in zero gravity that uh, you wouldn't have expected? Well, Alan, first of all, I'd like to say, uh, you know, I was really impressed with your, your feet, and I, uh, I want to challenge you to someday jump off the space station and parachute back to Earth. That would be really exciting to see. So you can put that on your list of, of things to do. But uh, as far as our, uh, you know, as far as the science we do up here and, uh, and knowing, um, you know, what the science is and what the, the outcomes are, um, it just depends. There's, uh, throughout the course of the year I'm here, there's 400 different uh, scientific experiments going on. Uh, you know, some of those go on outside the space station and are almost completely transparent to us. For instance, my brother brought up the alpha magnetic spectrometer that's looking for dark matter and, uh, you know, antimatter and trying to figure out where, you know, most of the stuff, most of the mass in the universe is, is coming from. And that stuff goes from the, uh, you know, the sensor, the uh, spectrometer outside into the computer in here and uh, down to the ground for analysis. And we have almost zero interaction with it. Although on a spacewalk next week, we're going to put some insulating blankets on it because the cooling system's not behaving uh, properly. Uh, you know, that's one extreme. The other extreme is, uh, you know, stuff that we are intimately involved in, um, you know, which is mostly data collection on ourselves, like these eye exams I was doing uh, this week. Um, you know, as far as how the data uh, looks and, you know, what we're learning from that, you know, there is, there is some involvement. Uh, you know, I get, do get some feedback, but a lot of these things, like these scans we do, we have a, uh, you know, this uh, laser scanning device for our eyes. A, uh, we have a fundoscope, we have an ultrasound. You know, all that data gets uh, sent to the ground and, and uh, gets analyzed over time. Um, but, but I do have some understanding of, of what's going on. For instance, you know, there has been some changes in my, my uh, you know, my eye structure, similar to what I had last time on my six-month flight. But there are, you know, things that have happened with my, you know, my op op the optic nerve, the disc uh, itself. Um, and then as far as surprises of, uh, 
things that that we've learned that I didn't expect? Hmm, that's a tough question. I'll, I'll have to think about that one some more. And uh, but I, I will certainly get back to you. Next question. Hi, Scott. Uh, Josh McClure, Air Force Academy, 96. You're fulfilling a dream of mine and many of my friends. Uh, I, I'm working for a company called Health Anonymous. And uh, we've been talking a lot about health here and especially public health. You must have some sort of pathology lab or mass spec analysis or something up there. If you could tell us a little bit about the, uh, the tests that you do uh, to monitor your health. You, you must have some sort of a personal dashboard, health dashboard. And that's a dream of ours, I think, to get a, a personal health dashboard and periodic testing. If you could tell us more about that, I think everyone would love to hear it. Yeah, so we have a lot of uh, a lot of devices, uh, medical devices, like I was saying, the ultrasound, the fundoscope, a laser device for our eyes. Um, we do uh, data collection for science with those, and then uh, we also do things for our, our periodic uh, health assessments. But those are pretty basic kind of things, like uh, you know, taking pictures of our ears. We do uh, vision tests. Um, that are uh, pretty, you know, fairly benign, like you might see in, the, you know, when you go into your eye doctor. We do tonometry, which measures the pressure in our eye. You know, we take our, our blood pressure. Um, we don't do things like labs. We don't do blood work up here, although the Russians do have some capability to do some, some rudimentary stuff. But, uh, you know, we do take a lot of our own blood, and uh, it, we do centrifuge it. But it's uh, you know sent down to the ground for analysis, and we do that you know when we have the opportunity. And again, that's mostly for uh, scientific purposes and not um, health monitoring purposes. We haven't gotten to the point where you know we would have a, a device like you're talking about. Maybe like uh, you know I understand that you know the Apple Watch has some health monitoring uh, capability. Um, you know, we, we, we haven't quite gotten there yet. We do do uh, uh, this uh, VO2 max test. So you'll have, uh, you know, electrocardiogram on while you're doing uh, 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 exercise uh, cycle ergometer me to measure our cardiac health. Um, but, uh, you know, kind of like a personal, personal dashboard type thing where you get a lot of uh, maybe real time and uh, continuous monitoring of our, our health. We, uh, we don't have that yet. I think what happens is they try to get him in a pretty good spot before he launches, and then he's on his own. So then, you know, what happens happens, and a year later, you're going to come home. Something gets really bad, kidney stone, you know, where you have a major issue, there's always the, the, the option of leaving. Next question. Hey, Scott. Jimmy Crawford, Orbital Insight. So we had some really interesting talks yesterday about North Korea and, and presentations from some folks who had grown up there and then immigrated to the US and told some amazing stories. So I'm really curious from your very unique perspective, do you see a difference when you look at North Korea versus South Korea or the other areas in terms of how developed it appears from you from the space station? Do you see the difference in the nighttime lights that we see in some of the satellite pictures with your own eyes? It is shocking in, you know, the, how the situation is so bleak over there for those people, you know, from what we can see here, especially with regards to, you know, their, their electricity. Uh, Pyongyang uh, from space looks like a little smudge of light, uh, a speck in the ocean of darkness, which is North Korea. And uh, you see that uh, compared to Seoul, which is, uh, you know, just to the south. And, um, you know, it's just like night and day. And it's, uh, you know, it's really, it's sad to see. Um, during the daytime, when you look at North Korea, surprisingly, it's very, um, the air is, doesn't look very clean, but it's, you know, it's pretty obvious. It's not from North Korea industry. It's from a lot of the pollution that just gets uh, blown over from China. So, you know, not only do they not have electricity, but they are also, uh, you know, have, you know, Crappy, crappy air because of the, the pollution that China generates. It's really a, 
you know, a bad situation all the way around. And uh, like I said, very shocking to see with your own eyes. Thank you. Hi, my name is Nicolo Dimasi. I run a public company that makes games called Glue. And I've got a lighthearted question and then a more serious one for you. The lighthearted question is, do any of you actually kill time by playing games on the space station? Uh, and the more serious one is, do you think a round trip to Mars will lead to any permanent physical side effects, or will it be something that can be sustainably done numerous times for an individual? So um, none of the crew members up here now play any kind of games. I know we've had people in the past uh, play electronic chess with people on the ground. We don't have any, uh, we, we do have the capability, you know, with our laptops to have some, some video games. We have, you know, we have iPads and I'm sure there's some games on here. We actually use Google for our browser for our timeline. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and there are games on there, but I personally don't play them. We're really, really busy up here. Um, and there's very, uh, very little spare time. And the spare time I do have, I generally, uh, you know, look out the window, take pictures of the earth or, you know, watch a movie or some sports or something or read. And, uh, also we spend a lot of time on email and on the phone. Um, as far as the round trip to, to Mars question and doing it multiple times, um, you know, there are some challenges to going to Mars. I think they're not uh, things we can't overcome. But, uh, you know, one of the big ones is radiation. And, uh, you know, on my first flight, uh, which was to the Hubble Space Telescope, which was about twice the altitude we're at now, um, in seven days, I, I there at that altitude, I got almost as much radiation as I've gotten, or, or I'm sorry, half the amount of radiation as I've gotten since I've been here uh, since March. So it's about 10 times the amount of radiation. Um, my uh, lifetime radiation that I'll get um, over the course of being in space for 500 days, mostly at this altitude, protected by the magnetic field of the Earth and the Earth's atmosphere, will give me a 1% a chance of dying of uh, cancer as a result of that radiation exposure. So someone going to Mars is gonna have, you know, 10%, 20% chance. And, you know, to do multiple trips, you would, uh, you know, without finding a very uh, uh, practical and very, uh, um, you know, efficient, a good way to protect them from the radiation is gonna have, uh, you know, there's significant radiation effects that we're going to have to deal with that I think, uh, you know, is possible, but, uh, you know, something that needs, definitely needs some, some forward work. Scott, I'm going to jump in here for a second. So as the American who has now spent the most time in space, uh, what do you think about the prospect of somebody, not necessarily you, but as an individual making a one-way trip to Mars with the plan of living in that harsh environment and never having the opportunity to go home? So, you know, and, you know, if I was a little younger, um, you know, I, and it was something that would, uh, you know, worked out for me and, you know, eventually someone's gonna go to Mars, I would definitely love to, uh, be part of that mission, would be a volunteer, would be willing to do it. I would not be willing to go on a, uh, you know, a one-way trip to a, uh, you know, a destination where you are going to spend the rest of your life in a, uh, you know, in a closed environment or in a, uh, you know, a spacesuit when you go outside. Besides, you know, having been up here now for over 200 days, you know, besides the personal connection you miss with people on Earth, the next thing I miss is going outside, the freedom to, uh, you know, walk out my front door, feel the sun on my face, uh, you know, the wind at my back, uh, you know, put my feet in the grass, uh, you know, those kind of things is something that uh, I definitely would not want to uh, live the rest of my life with. You know, I could, without, I could do it for maybe a few years, but, uh, you know, I would never, uh, never dream of, of giving that up. 
Uh, hi Scott, my name is Louis Cole. I run a popular travel adventure daily vlogging channel on YouTube. I actually uh, spoke to you, well, via like a video message earlier in the year in May. NASA approached a few vloggers. Uh, it was hosted on the NASA website. I don't know if you remember, but it's uh, it's an honour to actually have a like a live uh, chat with you now. Um, my question is. Um, I imagine the thought of returning when you do back to Earth, um, there's a lot of positives and it's exciting and I'm sure you're looking forward to it, but is there anything that you fear on a maybe psychological or health or, you know, is there anything you fear about coming back? That's an interesting point. You know, I just started thinking about coming back recently. I tried not to, you know, for a long time. And, uh, you know, it's, you know, people uh, that have been in situations, uh, you know, where they can't go home have, have given me the advice that, you, didn't, you know, you don't want to count down, you want to count up you know, the number of days. But uh, it has entered my mind. And I think, you know, I've been here over 200 days and it seems like I've been here a really long time. It's almost like I feel like I've forgotten uh, what it's like to live on Earth. And I, um, you know, I do feel a little bit apprehension of, you know, what it will be like to get adjusted, even though I really look forward to it. And, uh, but I think there is some, uh, there will be an adjustment period and it does give me a little bit of an apprehension for what that will be like. Um, the last time I flew a long duration flight, it was 159 days, about six months. And it took me about six months to feel back to normal, getting back into the routine of, of a, uh, you know, your daily life where it's kind of up to you to decide what you're going to do. I mean, we have this, we have this timeline here with a, with a, you know, line marching across the screen and it shows us what we're going to do in like five minute blocks. You know, some of the activities are much longer than that, but, you know, it's basically telling you what to do all the time and then you get home and, uh, you know, you don't have this. I think in a lot of ways it might be like, you know, how someone who's coming out of prison has a, uh, you know, an adjustment period and in some ways they're more comfortable in prison because their, uh, you know, their life is so, uh, you know, regimented and they, they've gotten used to it. So, um, you know, I'm not worried about the physical uh, part of that, but I am starting to think a little bit about you know, psychologically what it'll be like uh, leaving uh, this environment and going back to one where I have much more freedom. Taylor. Uh, Taylor Wilson here. Uh, I just wanted to ask a little bit about the uh, radiation environment on the ISS. I know it's low Earth orbit and you're shielded by the Earth's magnetic field, but do you have a shielded section or semi-shielded section? And what are kind of the dose uh, predictions over your, your mission? That was the first question. If I can ask a second one, if it would be, uh, what are some of the experiments you're working on right now as part of the ISS National Laboratory System? And maybe what's the most interesting one? Yeah, so um, there are certain areas that, uh, the only areas that are actually, you know, we're, we're shielded by design, our, our crew quarters have some uh, special, we call them bricks, but they're radiation absorbing material in them to give us more radiation protection while we're sleeping. And uh, one of the crew quarters that the, the Russian guys stay in doesn't have those. Uh, so that person actually gets a lot more radiation than the guy that's just sleeping across the hall from him. Don't ask me why it's like that, but it is. Um, and you can see it in some of their radiation monitors. They have these certain monitoring devices that's like a gel, and you can see these specks that are where this gel got uh, radiated. Um, and if you're the guy that lives without them, you can see what your gel is getting along with the gel in the test tube. Um, so the, the dosage we get, um, I'm trying to recall what the units are. Um, I'm, I don't want to be wrong, but I was thinking Miller Rem perhaps, and you can correct me if I'm, if I'm uh, kind of completely out to lunch there. But uh, I think over the course of the six months I've been here or seven months so far, I've gotten about, uh, 
50 to 60? And uh, correct me if I'm wrong on the units, please. No, I think it's millirem, so yeah. yeah. Is that like Chernobyl radiation? That's, yeah, that's not bad. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> next and the, uh, and the second part of your question um, about the National Laboratory, uh, a few months ago, seems like you know an eternity ago, we did a lot of experiments with, uh, with some rodents, mice, and uh, some of those rodents were National Laboratory rodents, and uh, you know we, euth we dissect, dissected them, euthanized them, dissected them, and uh, you know removed their organs. Uh, some of the stuff, uh, some of their bones, we x-rayed up here while they were still alive, see what kind of bone loss they were experiencing. And then, uh, you know, we're sending, um, you know, samples uh, back to the, back to Earth. You know, some of those are for a biotech company. Uh, some of the research, the National Laboratory research was, and some of it's NASA research more, uh, you know, dedicated to understanding, you know, what happens to us in this environment for ex exploration purposes versus the national lab that's more about improving, you know, health on Earth and, and for the people on Earth. Meredith. Hi, uh, I'm Meredith Perry, and um, I've always wanted to go to space, and I, I will hopefully before I die. Um, so uh, my, I, I also have two questions really quickly. Um, do you think that prolonged periods of time in zero gravity, um, you know, many years is something that humans could get used to, or do you think that if we actually end up living in actual outer space, uh, we'll need to simulate gravity by spinning the spacecraft. And, and why don't you guys spin the, the spacecraft at all, you know, just to give you guys a break every now and then? And then my second question is, um, how has being, <laughs> sorry, uh, <laughs> not that kind of spinning, you know what I mean? Um, how has being in space for such a long period of time changed your perspective on life? Do you remember the first question? Yeah, so that's a, a, a few questions, and if I if I don't hit hit them all, just just ask me again. But um, you know, we've talked about that. It would be more convenient and more efficient to have gravity up here. Um, you know, so many things that you do become so much more complicated because you you can't put anything down. You got a Velcro stuff to the wall, you lose things, you know, things float away from you. Although you get better at it, um, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, something that y you just have to learn to manage. And, uh, you know, a little bit of gravity, not Earth's gravity, but a little bit of gravity, you know, keeping stuff um, where it needs to be would go a long way. You know, the systems could be designed uh, more easily, perhaps, with, uh, with some gravity. Why don't we do that up here? I think it's just the, uh, you know, the engineering complexity of it and the fact that um, just making things more convenient for a space station like this is probably not a good reason with regards to maybe the cost that it would uh, take to do that, which I'm not uh, sure what that is. Um, as far as us physically, you do get used to living up here, and uh, you know sometimes I think I feel completely normal, but then the next day I think you know I don't. You know I still feel some uh, stuffiness and swelling in my head at times. Your digestive system, you know, some days it feels okay, and other days not. You know, gravity is very important for how it not only uh, you know allows us to to keep things. Uh, where where they need to stay, but also push things where they uh, don't need to be. So, um, and could you live like that for a long period of time? Yes. Would you like to live like that for a long period of time, um, like years? You know, maybe not. It's probably somewhat uh, somewhat person dependent. Um, any? Did I miss one of your questions? Why is it so? Is this? Uh, why is it so complex to uh, to spin the capsule in space? Because you know, uh, my understanding is that you know, if there's no friction in space, then if you just kind of give it that initial push, it'll just keep spinning, right? Well, it would yeah, that's true. But it would definitely 
It would definitely affect the, uh, you know, the usable volume of the spacecraft. I think you'd need a really big moment arm or you're going to have a pretty big gravity gradient. Like if I, you know, if I spin my body, I might have, you know, a lot more gravity at, at my head than I will right, right in the middle. So um, I think for that to be, to be a usable uh, solution, it would take a very large uh, spacecraft to then, you know, have that usable volume. Um, but, you know, this is just me thinking off the, the top of my head to answer your question. Maybe, you know, maybe my answer is wrong and maybe you could spin this space station. And, uh, you know, at this end, let's say, you know, this would this is the longitudinal axis of the space station. So, you know, about, uh, you know, 100, uh, probably about 150 feet down this in this direction is the Russian segment. So if we spun it around the, this space station around the center of gravity, I could, you know, be walking, you know, on this wall with a little bit of gravity, but, uh, you know, halfway towards the Russian segment, we'd be completely floating. Hey, Scott, um, I'm going to have to... Maybe that's a, a practical thing to do. It's, uh, I think, something that NASA hasn't really uh, considered because it hasn't, hasn't been required for us to do our mission. Um, but it's, you know, it's definitely a good, good idea. And, uh, you know, I think if people lived in space for a really long period of time, it's uh, definitely is something that would be more than just a nice to have. Hey, Scott, we're going we're gonna to lose you. Requirement if you were going to, you know, go on a, a, a mission for, you know, a number of years or, you know, live in space permanently. Hey, Scott, we're going to lose you in about 10 seconds. I want to thank you for your time. I know you've got a lot to do, but thank you very much. See, see you in six months. Hope you guys continue to enjoy the conference there. Thanks for joining me on the Space Station. Station, this is Hugh Chase, and you are the conclusion of the interview.